in summary, it's been kind of a long um, session, thrashed about a little bit, that happens. Um, key realizations, uh, I don't need to focus on web mapping from a Jupyter notebook. Uh, it's not really the goal here. The goal is to sort of visualize data oca occasionally, so I do need a map. Uh, and an interactive map is nice, but not critical. Uh, the web mapping will be left to the client. We'll come back to the client tomorrow. So today I've kind of simplified the map, uh, the notebook. I've removed, I tried bokeh, and I've removed both bokeh and um, folium. Um, folium got bogged down with the amount of data we were putting at it. I think if any, if we're going to send this much data to the client, it's going to be, uh, we're probably going to need to render it in a canvas layer instead of a DOM layer, like SVG layer. Um, I believe D3 still supports that, so we might be able to use something built on top of D3. I, another thing, a takeaway, I generally would like to use um, a data-oriented uh, plotting library. More on that later, but if you've ever used Seaborn or TauJS, uh, Tau charts, I guess, and I think, um, for example, anyway, those are data-oriented uh, plotting libraries. There's another one. Uh, I can't think of the name of it. Python uh, even has a light version of it, something light. But in any case, let's move on. <laughs> it's been a long session. I'm getting kind of tired. What we've done is taken essentially two different amenities, food sources and bus stops, and we wanted to see what buildings are within a convenient distance of those. Uh, where previously we had done just food sources, now we want to look for uh, buildings that are both within convenient distance of food source and a bus stop. So this is, I guess, uh, a composite analysis. I'm using this book as a reference. It's called Urban Analytics. It's a pretty brief book, uh, but it's interesting. And uh, it calls it a composite index. So I think that's kind of what we're doing. We're essentially creating two indices where we have one that's saying that this is within um, walking distance of a food source, and then this building is within walking distance of a bus stop. And we can then use those composite indices to make more to ask more uh, elaborate questions. And it's like essentially set theoretical. So let's just take a look. We have in our clipped data set just around the city of Tomper, we have 55 food sources. Those are basically convenience stores and um, supermarkets, I believe it was called. Copyright emptor convenience stores aren't necessarily food sources, <laughs> but uh, I don't know how to really uh, separate out classes of uh, subclasses of the convenience stores. I'm just relegated to the open street map data. Uh, there's almost 800 bus stops just in the same sample area, and there's 16,000 building geometries. And that's all I know is their buildings. I, there's a few attributes we can use, like if it's a retail. We might dig more into that, but for now, we're only looking at buildings as entities and finding if the, out if they're within convenient distance of amenities. Uh, so one way that I believe, I haven't benchmarked this, but the idea is that rather than looking for a building footprint within a bigger, complicated um, geometry, that looking for a building centroid would be faster makes sense to me. So, and I think some libraries they'll only let you look for point and polygon, and not polygon and polygon. You'd have to look at overlap or intersection things like that. Um, so yeah, we just get the building centroids here, and this is not all new, but uh, it's a bit new. And then just renamed the columns. Now, the reason for this is. I want to treat the building centroid as the first class citizen there, the primary um, geometry for these objects, so that when we're doing the later steps, it will look first to the centroids, and the, while at the same time keeping the building uh, footprint around. So we just did a little swap, swap a rooney there. Um, so now things are good, and you can see these other properties bleeding through. Uh, we'll, show you how we got those in a second and just check the data types. We have two geometry columns here. A geometry geometry column and a footprint geometry column. Um, this kind of gets important if you're when we were exporting a GeoJSON, but by removing the kind of idea in this notebook at least of um, web mapping, uh, it's simplified things quite a lot and there was just some weird errors. Uh, not really worth going into right now. 
So for food sources, um, you know, arbitrary convenience distance would be one kilometer. I think I'll walk maybe a kilometer to and from the grocery store to get a small couple of bags or a backpack or something. Uh, so yeah, all we do is just take those food sources and we add that buffer around them. And it returns a geo series, which is essentially a multi, oh, single row multi polygon. Um, this is a typo. There we go. Oh, what did I do here? Now for bus stops, the honestly, Tomper has such good bus coverage that if I did a one kilometer or even a 500 meter radius to bus stops, it's like covering the whole city. So the composite index or composite analysis wasn't very meaningful. Um, again, I could drop this one down to 500 meters, something like that. I don't know. The exciting thing is we're going to let the client, the end user, decide all these things. And I'll get to that in a minute. But essentially what we did is just um, these buffers create a bunch of circles, a you know, circle around every point, and we just dissolve those into, I showed this yesterday, but we're repeating it today, so uh, it wasn't too hard to figure things out, which we'd already done that, into a multi-geometry uh, by taking the union of those. Uh, you can see, I hadn't really plotted the bus stops pr before. Can do that just by way of example. Uh, another thing we, or I've, you know, figured out during the stream is that um, these buffer buffering operations are pretty quick. The operation, but and, and they can even be done in the client. I mentioned that a second ago, but uh, one second, let me just without taking too much more time on the stream. All right, so it's basically the same thing. This is just plotting points with a, um, a line thickness that essentially is like comes out similar to the the um, buffer. All right, sa same same shape, but. Uh, When we took the union of it, that gives us this shape. I'm not going to do too much more live coding on this. I've done four hours now of live coding. And the key thing is we want to take both of these and find their overlap, the places that have access to both amenities. And it comes out, you know, very similar to the, I mean, almost all of the food source buffers have, have ready, you know, transport access, uh, but it's just different enough that we can do a meaningful thing. Now here's the, what takes a while, is then for each of those buildings, 16,000 buildings in the, uh, just the selection in Tampere, uh, we're gonna check the building centroid against this geometry. So it takes under 20 seconds though. This one took a little bit longer because um, the food source's catchment maybe is simpler think of the deal here, whereas the uh, <laughs> access to amenities kind of polygon is much more complicated and might not have been dissolved properly. I'll have to take a look at this because um, I see some overlap in these points. I think it's just because of the line styling and not actually the fact that they weren't dissolved correctly. So that took on, uh, under a minute though. And the key thing is we'll just have to indicate to the end user this is a process that's going to take some time depending on the sample sizes and the uh, complexity of the buffer geometry. So it'll be something, they'll be able to design the analysis in the client, they'll submit it to a server, uh, and then somehow be notified on completion, hopefully just in, uh, not necessarily, quite, well somehow it'll be a push notification. We haven't gotten to that level yet. Uh, but that's it, so then what we have is actually kind of interesting. Now, just this can be overlaid on a base map, and then you can see at a glance areas you might want to have a design intervention. That's, that's useful and meaningful. Uh, but then when we actually materialize it, so to speak, we actually run it against all those buildings. You can see which buildings um, specifically meet the criteria 
the type of building, other things. So you could even do further analysis on top of this. So you could say show it's only retail buildings that don't or do or don't meet this criteria, or hopefully residential. I'll have to look more into the typing, the type properties. And here they are plotted. So here's the um, within food catchment, which is where we left off yesterday. Here's in the access to amenities. So you can sort of see the difference there. It's not a huge uh, difference. I had to tweak some of the, the parameters, but you can see uh, you know, some more actionable area here, perhaps. And here, there's a lot more distance. Again, with a base map, this would be a lot more meaningful. But that was the key thing, is just to figure out if this is even feasible or w meaningful. And the final thing we did here is just came back took a look at the data and we just checked the proportion of those values that have access to amenities, the proportion of buildings. And based on my definition of access to amenities, which is arbitrary, 90% um, of the buildings in, in the subset of Tampere didn't meet that criteria. And you can kind of see it here, but we can actually quantify it. And the important thing about this is not only can you get a statistical measure you could take to a meeting and show them visually as well as uh, more analytically, but you can track this over time. You can set a goal and measure against it. If you repeat that analysis, uh, there's a lot of things you would need to uh, probably make sure the data, uh, hmm. well, hopefully the data quality will only improve. And hopefully this is also would give an incentive for municipalities to contribute to uh, OpenStreetMap because that's the primary source of data here. We'll be cl cloning or mirroring the OpenStreetMap data and making some derived tables. But in, in essence, we're going to treat the OpenStreetMap as our immu immutable uh, source of um, initial source of truth and add some value to that, which will also be openly licensed um, under the same database terms, from what I can tell, depending on how the definition of facts uh, falls out and. The main value we're adding, though, is the analytical framework. So we want this project to be open source. We want it to support the open data and open source ethos in ecosystem. We've got to figure out what value we're adding as a project and potentially as a business, because we're trying to also form a business around there and be transparent about that, those efforts. So I mentioned that some of this was going to happen in the client side. And another great open source project which we have not had a chance to work with is TurfJS. It has a buffer method. And given that buffering these relatively small samples of data, like the number of convenience stores is under 100, and the number of bus stops was not that high either. Um, it's feasible to do this in a client, even like a tablet. So we had almost 800 clients, and we had 55 food sources in a subset of Tampere. Might not want to do this on the whole country or a whole state with huge cities like New York or California. But we can do some of these operations in the client. The important thing about that is it, it get, the closer to real-time feedback you can give people, the better. We're used to directly manipulating objects, pushing a a bottle on a table or um, and getting some kind of like feedback that something happened so the, the tighter you can make that loop the more intuitive and user friendly the tool is so if we can allow people to in meaningful terms tweak the buffer radius not have to think of it as a buffer but like a walking distance um, that would be powerful we can serialize this the output of that operation and it even has a uh, not only the buffer but it can do um, uh, it can dissolve the buffers too. Here it is, and it can f do things like finding intersection of different geometries as well. So we're gonna tomorrow start working on the Turf JS integration. So we're gonna swing back over to the, um, the experimental client UI. So far, we so here's our for what it's worth our sustainable urban, urban design uh, roadmap for business development. We're really trying to be fully transparent while acknowledging that not only do we want the project to be open source, we want it to be, uh, so we want to have a sustainable community around the project, we want to be financially sustainable. 
And so if you, join, if you go by our organization, you can check our business development roadmap. If you go by our source code repository, you can check out our software roadmap. And what I was going to point out here is we have this pull request in progress, which we'll I'll probably have merged by tomorrow. So you can see the kind of stages this analysis has gone through, the proximity analysis notebook, as well as our JavaScript user interface experiment. We haven't merged this in with the main project yet. We'll be swinging back over to this tomorrow, probably integrating TurfJS. Uh, but basically, right now, we're building on a project called Quasar and Vue.js. We have Mapbox JL, a GL for rendering this, the geospatial data. We're going to originally was con we're considering uh, rendering three dimensional data and getting kind of fancy. But I'm going to go back to just thinking in two dimensions. That's mostly what um, OpenStreetMap data is. It's 2.5 dimensional data. It's got some heights that we might ex end up extruding at some point. But to keep things simple, we'll just go with two dimensions, integrate TurfJS, try to start working with some buffering and uh, maybe intersections. But I believe that when it comes time to compute these intersections, the more computationally intensive part, it'll be best to do that on the server where there's a you know a guarantee of a certain amount of computing resources to be available to a certain extent, whereas end user devices vary wi widely on, that, you're on a tablet or a desktop with ample resources. So that's where we're at. It's been uh, a long session, but it was, I think, worth it, uh, just in terms of exploring, you know, failing, succeeding, and having a deeper insight into where we, this project might be going. So I appreciate your time. It was nice uh, everybody stopped by the, uh, the Twitch chat. It's always nice to have company. If you're watching this on YouTube, do feel free uh, to ask any questions. If, if you want to get involved with this project or others, Stop by CodeBuddies.org. CodeBuddies is a really excellent community. Uh, everybody there is both a teacher and a learner. The CodeBuddies platform is also open source on GitHub. So if you're interested in learning how to do open source development, you can get involved with either of these projects. We're uh, very um, open to contributors of all types. You don't have to be a coder. In fact, you can be a designer or somebody who's interested in just the idea of sustainable ur urban development. You're welcome to stop by and share your ideas, give us feedback. All right, well, thanks for your time and have a great day. I hope you're staying well out there.